Jesse, amazing Ruby. to have you back on the pod. Let's start with a question you probably get asked a lot, which is, what do you eat in the day? What do you like to know? I would love to know. <laughs> <laughs> what do I eat in a day? Um, especially when I'm traveling and busy right now, the first place I start, which is a total non-negotiable for me, is a savory breakfast. Okay, yeah. So this morning I had an omelet uh, with feta and tomatoes. Super simple. Even at any hotel they can make something like this mm. for you. And this really sets me up for the whole day so that my glucose levels are nice and steady. Mm. Then lunch is very variable. It depends. Sometimes I'm not even hungry until 2 or 3 p.m. because I had such a satiating breakfast. But I'll grab like a salad or a little sandwich or something for lunch. I don't usually have a lot of time, so I grab whatever's around me. Uh, and then afternoon, inevitably in the afternoon, I'm like, mm, I could do with a little cookie right now. <laughs> so inevitably in the afternoon, I'm going to find some something little chocolatey to have. And I always have a vinegar drink before that mm -hmm. to reduce the spike of the food mm -hmm. and then after i eat the little afternoon snack that i love i try to go for a 10 minute walk or use my muscles to do something so that i soak up the glucose from that snack mm -hmm. and then dinner is when i have a bit more time so at dinner i will always always start with a veggie starter mm -hmm. And generally, I have if I'm at home, I'll have some batch cooked veggies in my fridge. So preparing the veggie starter will be very easy, very quick. And that way you harness the power of fiber from the veggies to mm -hmm. keep your glucose level steady. And for the rest of the meal, I'll have like some protein and some carbs at the end. But that's generally how my day goes. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you've basically gone through the major hacks in your yeah. books <laughs> and you are literally living the oh, yeah. glucose way. Let's go into a bit more detail into those hacks. You, you mentioned the veggies and how the increased fiber blunts the glucose uh, spike, spike that you have after having a main meal. Talk us through a, a bit more about the mechanism behind that and perhaps some of the studies that uh, are evidence. Yeah, the first study that I'll mention, which is very interesting, it showed that you can eat the exact same meal, so the same ingredients, the same quantity, the exact same meal, but if you eat the elements of the meal in a specific order, you can reduce the glucose spike by up to 75%. Right. Not changing how much you're eating or what you're eating, just how you're eating it. Mm. And the, the correct order for your glucose levels was shown to be veggies first, then proteins and fats, and then carbs and sugars. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're faced with a meal which has, I don't know, broccoli, salmon, avocado, and rice, and then chocolate. Mm. That's and then chocolate. And, chocolate. <laughs> like, and then that. some chocolate. <laughs> the correct order for your glucose level is going to be to have the broccoli first, mm -hmm. then the salmon and the avocado, then the rice and the dessert. Mm -hmm. So that study made it very intriguing for me to try to understand what was going on. Why the veggies first? Why is that so powerful? And it's because veggies contain one of my favorite substances, fiber. And for me, Fiber, she's just such a badass superwoman. I'm obsessed with her. So Fiber is found in great quantities in veggies. And when you eat this Fiber at the beginning of the meal, mm -hmm. that's really important at the beginning of the meal, it has time to coat your upper intestine with a protective gooey shield. And it stays in place in your gut lining for a few hours. And that protective shield then prevents any glucose molecules coming down from let's say pasta rice cookies etc afterwards it prevents those glucose molecules from passing too quickly into your bloodstream mm. so you can still eat the carbs that you love yeah. but with less impact on your glucose levels yeah yeah which is great i mean like we've talked about um having more fruits and vegetables in the diet per se but i think this sort of nutrient sequencing as it's referred to in papers is just absolutely fascinating and it's a really easy strategy to ensure that you're not having those big ups and down swings that can lead to cravings and lead to totally. the hypo sort of and uh, and the thing is like so in these studies you have the sort of theoretical very strict order right you yeah. have like veggies then proteins and fats then carbs and sugars you don't need to do something that hardcore in real mm. life the one thing that I want you to remember, though, is that the veggies first, mm. that's where you're going to harness most of the power. Yeah. So don't worry about separating out proteins and fats and blah, blah, blah. Just focus on veggies first. Yeah. And you're going to get such a big impact on your health. Yeah, absolutely. Have you come across anything other than vegetables first that could uh, yield the same results in terms of glucose balancing? <sighs> I mean, yes, because all my hacks are quite powerful in their own way. So, for example, switching from a sweet to a savory breakfast, mm. 
that has a massive impact on your glucose levels because you could be going from a big glucose spike to virtually no spike at mm. all. So in that sense, if you make such a big change, the impact will be even bigger. Mm. Um, but veggies first is really easy and powerful. Then there was this whole thing about vinegar. Yeah. Vinegar is another interesting one. Um, people love it because it feels a bit like a, a magic bullet. But yeah. I want to remind everybody, it's just one tool in your yeah. toolbox. Yeah. And the studies show that one tablespoon of vinegar in a big glass of water, so it's, you know, a big glass of water like the one I have in front of me here, that can reduce the spike of your meal by up to 30%, mm. right? And you have that. Then you have moving after eating, which also has a tremendous impact on your glucose levels. But yeah. if I were to sequence the hacks um, in order of, most important, most powerful, I would always start with the breakfast, actually. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's talk a bit about, because you mentioned vinegar, let's talk a little bit about the science behind mm -hmm. why vinegar can help with glucose. Because I think, I remember we said this on a previous podcast, you have this incredible knack of distilling quite complex scientific concepts into something that everyone can understand, which explains why, you know, <laughs> the glucose method has absolutely exploded. So perhaps we could talk a bit more about the, the vinegar and why vinegar can have this drastic impact on blood glucose. For sure. And it's interesting because most of us have vinegar in our kitchen. Yeah, totally. And we don't realize yeah. we have this incredible ingredient. So vinegar contains another one of my favorite molecules called acetic acid. Mm. Acetic acid is pretty awesome. So acetic acid slows down how quickly food breaks down into glucose molecules when you digest it. So it's there, it's working its little magic. So as a result, if you have some vinegar and then you have, let's say, some pasta, the pasta will turn into glucose molecules more slowly. And that's really the key, Rupi, because what we want to do is we want to reduce how quickly glucose arrives into our bloodstream. We want to sort of taper the, the velocity, you know, so that, yes, we get a glucose rise, but it's not a crazy mm. Himalaya rise. It's more like a rolling, you know, Swiss mountains. That's what you want. You yeah. want to get glucose arriving in your bloodstream at a slower pace so that you don't get the crazy ups and downs. So that's vinegar. It's acetic acid. It's very mm. straightforward. Mm. So one tablespoon, big glass of water before eating, and um, it's quite powerful. You can do it once a day. That's what I recommend. Um, a lot of people ask me, what about lemon? Mm. Does that work? So lemon contains citric acid, mm -hmm. and that's a different molecule. It doesn't work as well as mm -hmm. vinegar, but it's still powerful if you are not a big vinegar fan. And then what you can do actually is make a vinegar dressing mm. and put it on your veggie starter. Yeah. So you can all you can combine them, but that's why you know I'm French, and in France we have this tradition of starting the meal with a, a salad and a vinaigrette, so yeah. a vinegar dressing. And as I was learning the science, I was like, God damn, like all this stuff has been known forever, yeah. actually. This yeah. is not groundbreaking stuff, but we've lost touch with so many of these cultural habits that are actually super good for us. I mean, you see this all the time, right? We yeah. have to go back to how we were eating. Totally, yeah. I mean, you know, when we were talking about fiber and probiotics and vinegar, you know, the first thing I think about is pickles and traditional ferments yes. and stuff that we generally start a meal with. And if you look at the sort of pattern of different cultural ways of eating, in Indian food, we have, you know, different sort of mango and lime pickles. Mm. In washaku, which is that sort of traditional way of eating Japanese food, yeah. you start off with a ferment. In Italian, so my wife's Italian, you know, there's antipasti, Absolutely. there's all these different sort of, it, it's sort of like embedded in the code of like how our ancestors ate, which is why I find it so fascinating yeah. where science sort of adds another lens as to explain why. We they sort explain of that why out. with the science so we can go back to those. And same with the breakfast, right? Mm. The invention of sweet breakfast food, mm. essentially dessert first thing in the morning. Yeah. That is a total invention of the food industry. Totally. This was not, we did not used to do this. Yeah. We used to have, breakfast was a normal meal. Yeah. It was not like, oh, in the morning we eat, you know, dessert. And Sugar. then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you think about it, but it's become so commonplace. Yeah. And we all think it's normal to have cereal and orange juice in the morning when actually it makes no sense. And it's really an invention for yeah. profit of the food industry. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. There was this really interesting article, actually, that was done by, I think it was The Guardian and The New York Times. And a photographer went and sort of photographed what kids eat around the world. Really? Yeah, and they went to sort of US, they went to obviously England, but India, Sri Lanka, Japan, Korea, and they just had wildly different starts of the day. And you could tell like which one was healthier. Mm. And if you sort of do a little bit more homework and map where the obesity issues are, 
whilst it is definitely growing in in nations like India and and, and Southeast Asia, um, it's nowhere near as bad as it is yeah. in the US. And you can just see the patterns of eating for kids at the start of the day offers some sort of like uh, suggestion as to what is going on yeah. uh, at a population level. So I, I find that fascinating. I think we sort of need to return to that traditional way of eating. Exactly. And I grew up you know, in France and every morning for breakfast, I had a Nutella crepe oh, right. with orange juice. Oh, wow. And my mom would have special K yeah. with an orange juice. And then I remember so vividly, she would grab the pot of sugar and then sprinkle a butt, like three tablespoons of white sugar onto the bowl of special K. Yeah. And now when I think back, I'm like, no wonder I was so hungry by 10 a.m. in class. No wonder I felt exhausted. Yeah. No wonder I woke up always with this pain in my stomach. Like I'm so hungry. Yeah. You know? I was on a glucose roller coaster my entire childhood. Absolutely. Yeah. And now my favorite breakfast is just to have dinner leftovers and crack an egg in the pan. That's today. literally what I had this morning. I literally so, had like uh what, so when we got because I got back from Australia yesterday. Uh, I'm doing all right. You're doing <laughs> I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm very impressed. <laughs> I had a good sleep last night, but one of the most comforting meals that I like is something quite traditional. So it's chickpeas, lentils, a whole bunch of veggies, and it has some coconut milk and loads of different spices. Mm. And I literally had that for this morning with an egg cracked into it Perfect. as well. So like for me, that's like a great start of the day, leftovers. Perfect. But people sort of have this aversion, I think, particularly in the UK, mm -hmm. to having something savory or leftover from dinner for breakfast. But that's kind of like level two, Yeah, I think. Level one is going from sweet to savory and seeing how much better you feel and mm. how the days when you have a savory breakfast, you can actually take things off your to-do list. Yeah. And you feel amazing in yeah. your clothes and you feel energized. And then you're like, hmm, this thing is interesting. And then level two is when people start having leftovers for breakfast. Yeah. I even get messages from people who say that now they eat anchovies at breakfast. Oh, I'm very yeah. proud. Very yeah. proud. Yeah. So that's level two, guys. <laughs> Just chill out. Just first savory breakfast. And in my book, I even have recipes that are sort of savory takes on traditional sweet uh Breakfast. Yeah. So I have a savory jam on toast, ah. which is roasted peppers and feta on a sourdough um, piece. I have nut granola. Yeah. So no spiked granola and lots of these kinds of yeah. uh, first steps into the savory world. Yeah, definitely. Actually, I think this is probably level two as well. But you've also got a <laughs> savory smoothie, which I've started yes. doing a lot more of actually, because nice. I used the CGM a few months ago. Just I do it intermittently just yeah. to sort of like see how I'm responding, what kind of like, you know, insights I can gather. And I had a smoothie with, uh, I used to have it with oat milk, um, which I did, unbeknownst to me, shot my sugar right oh, up. Oh, yeah. And I had a corresponding crash and I would feel almost like trembly uh, after like my smoothie. And obviously it was just my my glucose roller coaster. And mm. I, I didn't really have the intuitive sort of sense to question the type of milk that I was putting in into my smoothie. So now when I do have a smoothie, which is, you know, not particularly often, I do a savory one nice. like you have actually yeah, in the yeah. book. So it's like almond butter, yep. protein, I powder. It's protein powder. And yeah. I call it savory, but actually there's fruit in there. Yeah, of course. It's just yeah, like, yeah. it's not a real savory smoothie, yeah. but it's, it's a smoothie that keeps your glucose levels steady because yeah. it has protein in it yeah. and fat and not too much sugar. On the topic of oat milk, I think people need to understand that the way oat milk is made is that it's just taking oats and pulverizing them into this juice. It's mm. making oat juice. And similarly, you can make pasta milk. If you cooked pasta, blended it with a bunch of water until it was completely liquid that would be pasta milk and when you're having oat milk it's just liquid starch mm -hmm. right it's just thousands and millions of little tiny glucose molecules just running around in this raw water and creating a big glucose spike in your mm -hmm. body because mm -hmm. when you make milk from a starch it's just starch juice but if you make milk from for example almonds coconuts so nuts or pistachios yeah. because nuts contain protein and fat mm. you're going to get a milk that is much steadier for your yeah. glucose levels yeah but I, I i just went back to whole milk cow yeah. whole cow's milk great source of protein mm. i'm not intolerant mm. i do great on it so yeah 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 i think a lot more people are probably moving back toward that as oh, well yeah, i think it's a good idea and for those who have intolerances yeah there are like three ingredient milks out there mm -hmm. that are i think are great and they won't spike your sugar they won't lead to that Roller coaster, and it's certainly something that I'm doing more of these days when I have a smoothie. Um, last one, let's talk about movement because yeah. I think this one 
is super, super easy to do. And there are sort of like Ayurvedic sayings and there are a whole bunch of sort of um, traditions. traditions, yeah, in like moving after eating that I think are, are, you know, something that we've lost and you're bringing back to the surface. Again, again. it's so traditional <laughs> and it's not groundbreaking. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now we understand the science behind it. So why moving after eating? Well, first you have to understand that glucose is your body's favorite source of energy. Mm -hmm. And every single cell muscle in your body uses glucose for energy. So for example, anybody listening, make a fist with your right hand right now and really squeeze it. As you're doing this, the muscles in your hand are using glucose to be able to contract. And so we can use this to our advantage. If after a meal, we contract our muscles for 10 minutes, some of the glucose from that meal is going to be used and burned by mm. your muscles for energy instead of hanging around and creating a big glucose spike. And when people hear movements and contracting muscles, they're often like, oh, God, I don't want to go to the gym. Like, I, what is this intense thing going to be? It actually doesn't have to be intense at all. It can just be 10 minutes of walking. Mm. Just grab a colleague, grab a friend, go for a 10 minute walk after your meal. It can be cleaning your apartment it's become a thing for me because I'm quite a messy person. So I'm like, well, I just ate, so I have to clean my apartment for 10 minutes. So you make a little deal with yourself yeah. like that. It can be playing with your dog. It can be picking up your kids. It can be dancing to a few of your favorite songs. It can be if you're sitting at your desk, you can just put your feet on the ground and then do some calf raises. Mm. Nobody will even notice. Yeah, yeah. You can do it during a meeting. You're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm burning glucose molecules right now. And this is quite powerful because your calf contains as the celeus muscle, yeah. which is very good at soaking up glucose from the mm. bloodstream. So that's the, the fourth hack I recommend in my method. 10 minutes of movement after one meal a day. Make it super simple, easy. Get a friend to do it with you. And that's going to help your glucose levels a lot. Yeah. And you've done some research with your community yes. based on this, right? I want to dive into that because that was something that I don't think we got to chat about last time. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a bit of work over the summer and you were telling me about it and yeah. it just sounded so impressive. So let's Thanks. talk about some of those numbers because yeah. they are brilliant. Well, so for the second book, I because I'm a scientist, I was like, I just really be so cool to get some data. Now, mm. if there are any scientists listening, this is not I did not run a placebo controlled randomized trial. This is was just an experiment. Yeah. So what I did is I recruited people off my Instagram to test out my four-week method before the book even came out. So I gave them all the instructions, all the recipes, and at the end of each week, they would send me a little, the answers to a questionnaire, and I would just ask them how they're doing. So they just added four hacks into their life, mm. savory breakfast, vinegar, veggie starter and movement, and importantly, the rest of the time, they ate and drank whatever they wanted. Whatever they want. Yeah, so okay. we're just adding things in. When I'm not controlling anything else about your life. I'm just add these hacks in and see how you feel. So the results were amazing. <laughs> Let me read you the stats. So after four weeks of the glucose gratis method, we have 90% of people were less hungry. 89% mm -hmm. of people reduced their cravings. 77% of people had more energy. 67% of people said they were happier, which I think is so important. Mm. Mental health, how you feel about yourself. Then we have amazing stats on sleep, on mental health, on skin. 41% of people with diabetes improved their diabetes in these four weeks. 35% of people with hormonal issues also improved them in these four weeks. And so note on weight loss. What I propose is not a diet, mm -hmm. right? The objective is not weight loss. But however, when you study your glucose levels, you're doing three, three things. You're reducing cravings, reducing hunger, and increasing fat burning. Mm. So naturally, a lot of people lose weight without even trying. And so in this experiment, 38% of people in these four weeks lost weight, lost fat on their body, which is something that a lot of people are looking for, without counting calories, without cutting out foods, yeah. just by adding these four hacks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's super impressive. And Thank I wanted you. to dive in to cravings yeah. because... Cravings, I think, is something that you're paying a bit more attention to. Mm -hmm. um, why, don't we, why don't we actually discuss what a craving is potentially caused by? Because mm -hmm. I guess the scientific definition of a craving is like an intense desire for a particular type of food. Yeah. What it, in certain circumstances may be the reasons behind somebody has a craving? So I'll mention my favorite study of all time which was done in the U.S. at Stanford. So researchers recruited participants and put them in an fMRI scanner. Mm. You know those scanners where you can see the brain activity? 
And while the participants were in the scanner, the researchers were showing them on a screen in front of their faces images of foods. So like broccoli, burger, salad, cookie. And they asked the participants to rate how much they wanted to eat the food. So imagine you're in the fMRI scanner and you see a photo of a cookie. You have to say one to ten how much you want to eat it right now. Mm. But that's not all. The researchers also were measuring the participants' glucose levels in mm. real time. And this is what they found. They found that when people's glucose levels were steady, they didn't rate any of the foods very highly. It was like broccoli, five. Cookie, five. Burger, five. But when the people's glucose levels were dropping mm. and were low, all of a sudden, they were rating the sort of junk food items really high. They were like, cookie, 10. Burger, 11. You know? <laughs> and what the researchers found was that as the participants' glucose levels were low, there was a part of their brain that was activating. And that part is the part that is in charge of cravings. Right. So the craving center of their brain was going like beep, beep, mm. beep, and causing this desire for these junk food items. Yeah. So what did we learn from this? We learned that cravings can come from having dropping or low glucose levels. Mm -hmm. And when do we have low glucose levels? After a spike. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you're having a breakfast that is just carbs. So let's imagine a fruit smoothie, an oatmeal cappuccino, and some toast and jam, okay? That's going to send your glucose levels on a big spike, and then a drop 90 minutes later. And that drop is going to activate your craving center, and then you're going to be looking for a cookie or a chocolate bar. Yeah. And that urge is not something that you can control, because yeah. you're fighting against an evolutionary <laughs> reaction yeah. in your brain. Yeah. And so when you have a craving... You cannot suppress it. It's, you cannot just apply willpower to it. It's mm. really hard. Yeah, absolutely. It comes from within your biology. Mm. So if you're somebody who relates to this, understand that often your cravings can be caused by what you had at your previous meal. Mm. So if you study your glucose levels, the, the spikes are going to be less pronounced, the dips will be less pronounced, and then you'll have fewer cravings. Yeah. Putting this into a practical context, I remember when I became a junior doctor, this is like 15, 16 years ago now, uh, and I would start my day with cereal, you know, something quick to eat as I rushed out the door, a quote unquote normal breakfast. Yeah. And then around 10 or 11 a.m., like after the ward round and stuff, I would have this intense desire to just eat anything. And usually in that environment, there are some cookies or like Haribo, jelly, sweets, whatever at the nurse's station that I just quickly grab as mm -hmm. I carry on with my day. And I think most people can recognize a similar food environment, a similar context where they have that same sort of intense craving and that desire um, with the opportunity of having something that's quite refined and sugar laden. And so part of why I think I'm on the fence, or not on the fence, I'm more bullish around this idea of controlling glucose is because it does have a significant impact in the practical implications on a, on a day-to-day -day basis of like how people interact with food. Yeah, and yeah. how are your cravings now? Oh, my cravings are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my cravings are great because yeah. I have protein in the morning. Mm -hmm. I have much less refined sugars. I'm much more aware of like spikes and stuff as I've lent more into nutrition and nutritional medicine. Um, and I don't really have that desire to have like that. Also, I think part of it, um, Jesse, is mm -hmm. my palate has changed significantly over the last couple of years that I've lent more into the bitter flavors of food yeah. and the spices and everything else. And actually, if I eat, you know, something that is really, really refined, I have almost like an aversion to it. That doesn't mean that I don't have a sweet tooth. I like literally just, as I was saying, I got back from Australia and like, oh, you know, you? I, I have, <laughs> 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 I had lamington, do you want a lamington is? No. Oh my gosh. It's like the sponge cake that is covered in chocolate <laughs> and uh, it has a layer of jam in it and it has coconut flakes on top like the little cookies but in cake form yeah basically similar to that but oh my gosh it's like amazing it's like in the square form and stuff and it has this like bounce to it and it's like a real sort of aussie mm. you know sweet thing and obviously i'm gonna have that and obviously i'm gonna like enjoy uh you know brunch in the mornings and all those like sugar laden stuff 
but I don't have that sort of intense craving on it every single day. That's the difference. That's the difference, right? Mm. Going from a space where you feel controlled by a desire to eat anything sweet around totally. you to a space where you just are in pleasure mode. You're like, yeah. oh, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to go back to that bakery because I have a meeting at this place. I'm going to get my favorite cookie. Yeah. And you feel excited and happy about yeah. it. You don't feel like... Oh my God, like give me a chocolate bar. It's a very different experience yeah. of the sugar and of the food. Totally. And that's that's such a nicer way to experience mm. sugar mm. when it comes from joy and not, you know, shame and guilt and feeling controlled by the urge. Totally. And within that context, so let's say, you know, we're having a healthy relationship with when we choose to eat something yeah. indulgent. What are the kinds of foods that you feel people are consuming that are leading to those uh, spikes, spikes and crashes unbeknownst to them. So one of them we've already mentioned was oats and oat milk, yeah. I think, which is a you know a great sort of starting point given how popular it is. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other culprits that perhaps people don't really recognize at this point? Fruit smoothies. Oh, yeah. So you know all those innocent <laughs> smoothies you find at, at the train station and it says healthy on it yeah. and no added sugars. But yeah. actually, if you know how to decipher it all, you realize that's just sugar water. Even if it's orange and it looks yeah. innocent, it's not. So mm -hmm. those, uh, any sort of breakfast foods or breakfast bars, mm. I think, I think those are uh, not great, especially if you have them first thing in the morning. Yeah, you know those cereal bars with dates, etc., and rice syrup, etc. If you have that for breakfast, it's going to create a big spike. I think my, so. My pet peeve are the food items that people think are healthy and marketing is very convincing yeah. but actually are really bad for you when mm. you do glucose levels for example if you look at a chocolate muffin everybody knows that has sugar in it that's a dessert mm. but if you look at a you know a fruit smoothie or an oat milk something mm. or you know an acai bowl or granola mm. a granola bar mm. you might not know that actually it's causing a big spike in your system and everybody is trying to make healthy choices and most people who drink for example fruit juices or fruit smoothies They are doing that because they truly believe that that is good for them. And the marketing is very believable. Yeah. So that's really what I'm trying to fix here. The issue of food products pretending to be healthy, yeah. but actually being really unhealthy. If you look at a, you know, a chocolate, for example, nobody, there's no trick going on there. You know, there's no label on the chocolate bar that says, oh, gluten-free, no added sugar, good for your heart. It's chocolate. Yeah. It's a chocolate bar. Yeah. People know that it's you know it's sweet yeah. the ones that i hate are the ones with the misleading marketing and we need to teach people from the ground up but we also need more regulation in the food industry so that ultra processed food products cannot yeah put on the label stuff that seemingly makes them look healthy yeah i agree completely i think it's so easy to be duped yeah. even if you are educated around food and you feel like you're reasonably educated enough to recognize what is good and bad You can still get tripped up. Yeah. One of the pet peeves I have, and I saw this actually at the airport, is, are these sort of like um, immunity shots, right? So, mm. you know, ginger and turmeric and all the rest of it. It's got those sort of like highlighted on label. In reality, those only constitute less than 20%. And what's the majority of it is apple, apple juice. juice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just apple juice every yeah. time. And I always read it and I'm like, this is just pure sugar. Yeah. And like... Fair enough. It's a tiny shot. So the impact of that is going to be less than if it was a full sort of 300 mil. For sure, smoothie. but it's not about that. It's about the tricking exactly. of the it's consumer. The tricking. Exactly. It's the tricking of the consumer. You yeah. know, another one that I hate are uh, cookies or biscuits that say vegan and gluten free. Yeah. And of course, if you've heard that, if you're trying to be health conscious, you see these labels like, oh, it's vegan and gluten free. That must be good. Mm. But actually something vegan and gluten free can be way worse for your body yeah. than something with eggs and gluten. Mm. So as what I tell people is as soon as you see that kind of health halo on a food packaging, just consider it to be dessert. Red flag. Red flag. It's like, <laughs> this is dessert. Okay. Yeah. This is, for, this is for pleasure. Dopamine release in your brain. It's yeah. not going to be healthy for your body. Actually, I think a good heuristic actually is to, whenever you see that sort of, lovely dark green packaging with something that says healthy or like full of fiber or all these different flags that's a red flag straight away yeah. and then you should be a lot more sort of primed yeah. to you know decipher exactly what is in this bar 
uh, or this product or whatever. And I think protein bars mm -hmm. are probably some of the biggest culprits. I, I've had a lot of people and, and patients in the past who had gut uh, issues and, you know, you sort of dig into what they're eating and A, it's very, very restricted because, you know, it might just be like brown rice or broccoli or whatever because they're the type of people that eat a lot of these protein bars. But when you look at the ingredients of what's in these protein bars, it's a lot of emulsifiers, thickeners, things that are generally pretty bad for yeah. your gut, um, as well as all the refined sugars and stuff that are going to be spending mm -hmm. your, your glucose up and down. And another one I would say is the no added sugar label. Mm. This does not mean there's no sugar in it. Mm. This just means that the sugar was not added during the creation of the food product. It just means it was there since the beginning. So, mm. for example... An orange juice, which has as much sugar in a can as a can of Coke, mm. can absolutely have the label no added sugar yeah. because the sugar is from the original orange ingredient. Mm. You see what I mean? So that's when I hate because yeah. no added sugar does not mean no sugar. Yeah. It, yeah, can, yeah. it can mean a whole lot of sugar. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, cool. Uh, we, um, we're, we're basically talking about everything from the sort of assumption that mm -hmm. Keeping glucose levels flat is optimal, but there is some debate about this, isn't there? And I'm sure you're aware of some of the skeptics around whether we should even be measuring glucose mm -hmm. and actually, you know, our oscillations in our glucose on a day to day basis responsible for the uh, the, the sort of uh, predisposition to type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. and all the other complications that can occur when your average glucose level is raised over yeah. time. Um, why don't we discuss some of those sort of anti I'm so happy we're having arguments. this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I think it's super I important. think it's really healthy yeah. to have sort of a pragmatic discussion Absolutely. without finger pointing yeah. to sort of like question. I mean, you're a scientist. Yeah. You know that skepticism is important cynicism is something else i always have this thing where it's like you can definitely lean into the skeptics uh because they're there to sort of like ratify the truth cynics despite the wealth of evidence to the contrary will always be cynical and i think there's a big difference what, what i like to say is don't turn cynicism into inaction mm. right like it's great it's great to question but don't question and become cynical to a point where you don't even try new things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so great debate, super important. So many things to cover here. Um, I think maybe the first one we should look at is should everybody be tracking their Google levels okay, if you yeah, want? Yeah, that's definitely a good place to start. So when I started my work five years ago, I was really pushing the glucose monitor thing. I was like, everybody should get one. It's amazing. It, it changed my life. And it's the reason I got interested in this in the first place. And then I realized I don't think that's the right line mm. because wearing a glucose monitor can be very confusing. The data is not simple to interpret. It's really not simple to interpret. Listen, even I, sometimes I'm like, what the heck is going mm. on with this data? All those fake lows and the spikes and I get messages from people every day like, my glucose is 86, now it's 94. You know, do I have diabetes? Be be people don't know how to interpret this medical data. Yeah. And I don't think it's a good idea for everybody to slap on a glucose monitor because mm. it can lead to more stress and confusion than anything else. And another thing that I realized is that most people can get all the benefits from steady glucose levels without wearing a glucose yeah. monitor. If you use my hacks and you just track like the participants in my study who were not wearing CGMs, mm -hmm. if you just track cravings, energy, hunger, sleep, and mood, mm -hmm. you're golden. That's you got it, it all. Yeah. And you'll feel the difference in your body anyway mm -hmm. very quickly when you apply the hacks. So, yeah, my, my view on this has changed very significantly over the past few years. Well, how are you feeling? I feel very similar to that. I think the benefits of CGMs are certainly there for people who respond well to, you know, what's what gets measured, gets managed. But I think in the same way, calorie counting can tip people over into oh, yeah. anxiety. Oh, yeah. CGMs offer the same potential downfall as well. Um, I personally find wearing a CGM every quarter or every C uh, six months, you know, for uh, 10 days or so, yeah. just to sort of like see how I'm responding to food. I find that incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of of an education level being a medic and nutritional medicine master's student um, where I can interpret some of that. Some of the stuff I can't. Some yeah. of the stuff I'm like, I don't really understand what's going on here. And I think the other thing that is really important to ensure people are aware of is it's not always what's on your plate 
that can yes. impact your glucose levels. Stress, stress, hydration, movement, time totally. of the month for Tot- women. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, time Sleep. of the month is very, very important. Mm-hmm. That doesn't get enough airtime either. No, 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 I no. think, you know, during that luteal phase, mm-hmm. you're going to find that you're going to have more spikes regardless. Yep. And I think also the uh, the impact of uh, emotions whilst eating can certainly have an impact yep. on your glucose levels. Yep. So uh, that all being said, you know, as long as you're aware of the caveats of not everything is going to be nutritionally uh, influenced, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, on your your glucose levels, I think they can still offer some sure. benefits. And we sure. also have to say, like, the first time you put on a glucose monitor and you see, oh, my gosh, my food is actually impacting my body yeah. immediately. That is a huge aha moment. Yeah. And it's quite important to have that realization because mm. it changes everything. So, mm. I mean, there's pros and cons, right? And if you're somebody who wants to wear a glucose monitor, and this is not a plug for my work, I'm just saying get my first book, Glucose Revolution, because it goes in depth into all the different patterns, what mm. you see, what influences your glucose levels, because I just don't want you to put one on and become super overwhelmed and stressed out. Totally. So, you know, so, I mean... And I think people can self-identify with whether tracking something is going to make them feel good or not good. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I also see it in myself when I wear a glucose monitor. Of course, it's motivating. But also sometimes I'm like, you know what? I just don't want to look at what this cookie did to my glucose levels. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to ignore this and not look at the data <laughs> because I know it's not good for my glucose. Yeah. And I use the hacks to minimize the spike. But also like I don't want a machine to tell me whoa, Jesse, you ate a cookie. I'm like, yeah, I know I ate a cookie. Yeah, like, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the same way, actually. So I wear an Aura Ring um, and I've been wearing one for about five years and and like full disclosure, they gifted it to me. And I, I love it for yeah. a number of reasons because it helps me dictate the type and the intensity of workout that I'm going to be doing in the mornings. Oh, I cool. tend to work out every day. And, you know, I want to know that I'm well rested enough that if I'm going to do this like long endurance bike ride, it, it, it's going to be to the benefit of me rather than at the detriment because I haven't rested and recovered properly, right? But if I know I'm going out for a friend's wedding, let's say, yeah. and I'm going to be up until two in the morning, I take this thing off <laughs> because fine. I don't want to know the impact on my sleep the following day. I'm yeah. not going to exercise the day afterwards. Yeah. I know my sleep's going to be terrible. I also don't wear this when I'm on a flight either because mm. I know ex- exactly what's going to happen as well if it's like, you know, a red eye flight. So I think there's the same sort of degree of uh, intuition and engineering that we can have around CGM use. Yeah. You need to be a lot more sort of like responsible for how you use it yourself totally. and understand the and pitfalls. do you ever have the situation where you wake up and you wore the aura ring and you feel good and then you look at your data and it's like you had a terrible sleep yes. and then your entire energy and emotion change you're like oh i guess i feel awful after yeah. all yeah that yeah yeah that has happened to me actually where i felt i've woken up and i'm like oh, i didn't feel too bad and actually my data says something otherwise yeah. and then i override my intuition yep. because uh I, 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 and I'm getting much better at just leaning more into my intuition, how I feel and my body is. Am I feeling relaxed? You know, do I have any aches and pains? Do I want to do something a lot more that intense than what my aura ring would otherwise dictate to me? I'm going to have the overall sort of yeah. uh, decision on that. So the, again, you know, it really depends on what kind of person you yes, are, I what kind so. of character. What and kind you of can get a lot type. of the benefits without wearing one. Yeah, totally, totally. Totally. And then I think another important point is... We don't want people to over-index and only focus on glucose. Mm. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you had understood that the objective was to keep a really flat glucose curve and that became your single focus. Well, a lot of things can actually go wrong Mm. because if you add a lot of butter or a lot of processed oils to a meal, that's going to reduce the spike of the Mm. meal because the fat is going to slow down starch breakdown. So the spike will be smaller, but it won't be better for you. Mm. Another example, if you add alcohol to a meal, the more alcohol, the more you're going to see this effect. It's going to reduce the glucose spike of the meal because alcohol messes with your liver, which is the control center for your glucose levels. So when you add wine, tequila, vodka, whatever to a meal, the glucose is going to be flatter than without the alcohol. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. And (laughs) sometimes when you exercise, sometimes when you exercise, you will see a big spike, a big glucose spike during exercise. And that's because your muscle 
is releasing a bunch of glucose into your bloodstream to fuel your mu- sorry your body is releasing a bunch of glucose into your bloodstream to fuel your muscles so if you're focused on your glucose levels you might think okay i need to add a lot of processed oils mm. i need to add a lot of alcohol and never exercise mm. so you can see yeah. the limitations yeah. we cannot <laughs> We cannot over-index on this one metric yeah. because that's going to be detrimental. Yeah, you know? There's so many other things that are important. Totally. But I like to see glucose as a really good window through which to look at your diet. Because when you study your glucose level, using my hacks, for example, a lot of other things fall into place. Yeah, yeah. You eat less sugar, you eat more vegetables, you mm. move more. So generally, we are operating in a space of things that most medical professionals would recommend Mm, right mm. but with the glucose science and the visual aspect of it all people actually make the first step and that's what i care about what i care about is behavior change how do i encourage people to actually do something yeah and if that's through glucose levels and showing you the graph and making it easy then that's amazing totally so i i I really disagree with medical professionals who are like super cynical oh the glucose doesn't matter blah, blah blah i'm like Who cares? The outcome is that people are eating more vegetables, more protein in the morning, moving more, less addicted to sugar. Like, give me a break. Mm. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) And I I, I think the visual aspect is very important there because in the same way, when I chat to patients, I give them a visual of what a healthy plate looks like. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have that visual in front of them every time they sit down to prepare a meal or order something whilst they're out. In the same way, giving them the sort of uh, visuals of glucose and what happens when you when you sit down to eat a meal or when you eat certain foods doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have that every single time. Mm -hmm. Like you said right at the start, you don't need to have a CGM every moment of every day to have the same intuition around the types of foods that you should be consuming every single day. And I think context is very, very important here. Because I, I think this is where the cynics kind of come out and like, well, you shouldn't have a glucose centric way of looking at your diet. That's not what you're you know, arguing for. It's very, very easy to just be cynical about it. And I think, you know, having a, a, a holistic idea of your diet that you talk about in the books is something that is going to be net beneficial to people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for every cynical person, there's a hundred doctors using my work and my visuals with their patients. So I'm like, like, bring on the cynics. I'm happy yeah. to have a conversation. <laughs> but also we have to make sure that we're not taking so much airtime with the cynicism that we're preventing people who really need this information from yeah. making changes. Ultimately, there's one billion people in the world today with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. Kids are eating 85 percent processed foods in the UK. Like we need to make a change. Mm-hmm. We need to help individuals have more information and we need to you know work with the food industry to improve products so yeah. we can talk a little bit about this and this isn't it's it's fun to debate but mm. also like let's get to work yeah let's yeah. get people healthier yeah you know? definitely yeah and i think there is a, a lot more evidence coming around the impact of oscillating glucose levels oh yeah actually having the highs and the lows attenuated oh yeah and and On also inflammation heart disease risk like all of that totally yeah and it is coming out like steadily and perhaps it wasn't there like four or five years ago mm-hmm. but i think the more people are studying particularly with the use of cgms that i think is pretty profound from a nutritional medicine point of view yeah. Um, the more information will come out about like why steadying your glucose level Completely. is net a good thing. And for example, there's a bunch of studies done in people without diabetes showing that the bigger the, the dip after a spike, the more hungry you're going to be before the next meal and the yeah. more you're going to overconsume food or junk food or whatever's around you. And in my book, I, you know, I, I talk about 300 different scientific studies mm. that underpin all this and that show you the, the correlation between glucose and aging and skin and hormones and brain fog I mean, the evidence is overwhelming and it makes sense. Blood sugar, and this is not really new. You know, one of the first people to talk about this was Mark Hyman 15 years ago. He wrote The Blood Sugar Solution. So it's been around. People have known about blood sugar for a long time, but it needs to be so common sense now, so commonplace. Just like drink water, brush your teeth, keep your glucose levels steady. That's that's the goal, really. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. I always get asked about specific supplements that can steady your glucose levels. Now, I think we've discussed before about these sort of, because particularly after popularizing vinegar, a lot of these like vinegar supplements came out and gummies and all that kind of stuff. And you were like, don't take those. They're full of sugar. And I remember looking at the ingredients was like, definitely don't take those because yeah. those will not steady your sugar and you know levels. these companies have popped up and have ridden the wave of oh glucose is a trendy thing and there's gummies out there 
that have two grams of sugar mm. per gummy. Mm. And they say vinegar gummies. So you think, oh, that's going to be good for me. I'm going to be able to replace the vinegar drink with this. And for the past years, my, my audience, my readers have asked me, Jesse, what do I do if I don't have vinegar in my purse or I can't have a veggie starter? I'm at a birthday party. My dad doesn't want to do the hacks. Is mm. there a supplement I can take? So I've been researching this very extensively. I found a couple of things. I found that most supplements on the market that claim to steady your glucose levels are at best not very effective and at worst actually contain sugar and are mm. bad for you. But I also found four very interesting plants that have been around forever that recently have been shown by scientists across the world to have a very powerful impact on your glucose levels. And so I got the highest quality ingredients, the highest quality plants, and I actually put them all in a capsule okay. for people to use. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I created this capsule called Anti-Spike. Okay. And it is cinnamon, antioxidants from green vegetables, uh -huh. mulberry leaf, and lemon peel extract, 100% okay. vegan, 100% natural. And what this supplement does, and this is supported by five years of clinical evidence, 25 clinical trials, it grabs 40% of the sugar from your meal. And instead of letting it go through to your bloodstream to create a big spike, it makes it pass through to your microbiome that feeds on it. Mm. So it's good for your microbiome and reduces the spike of whatever you're eating. Now, I know it sounds like a magic pill, and it kind of is, but I don't want people to just take this and not do the food hacks. Yeah. This is an additional tool in your tool belt for when you need it. But it's really amazing. So short-term impact, reducing glucose, reducing insulin, and long-term, reducing fasting glucose levels mm. and increasing GLP-1, which is the satiety hormone that sure. Ozempic acts yeah. on. But Ozempic <laughs> tricks your brain into thinking there's more GLP-1 in your body. Yeah. It's a trick. You yeah. don't actually have more GLP-1. Anti-spike actually increases GLP-1 after six weeks. So you feel fuller faster. So truly to me, this is like the ultimate sidekick. If you want one supplement that is the best in the game, this is the one to use. Okay. So we've established that this is a supplement. Yeah. So this is an addition to everything that you have in your diet. How, how, before we go into the individual ingredients, that sound fascinating. And I haven't come across the mulberry or the lemon peel stuff. So I really want to dive into that. Um, how do you use the supplement? Is it in a similar way to vinegar, like before a meal, yes. or is it like once a day thing? Anytime? It's before the meal of your day that's going to be highest in okay. carbs and sugars. You mm -hmm. take two capsules mm -hmm. right before eating, mm -hmm. just right before, puff, and that's it. Okay. Do that every day to unlock the long-term benefits also of the plants. Fab. Okay. Yeah. Cinnamon. So uh, how much cinnamon is in it and what are the sort of Well, cinnamon types? is actually, interestingly, one of the most studied mm. compounds for improving your glucose levels. Mm. And it's been used for millennia. People used to make cinnamon tea, yeah. for example. And so I put it in here because it's so robust and it's so, in a sense, old school mm -hmm. it's not the most powerful thing so we put 85 milligrams in here but it's supporting you long term mm -hmm. okay and cinnamon has been trendy for a while but it's not the one i'm the most excited about okay. because cinnamon as i said is old school the new molecules the new plants that really are taking center stage and are so exciting is one the lemon peel extract mm -hmm. okay so that's just polyphenols from lemon and that unlocks the long-term benefit on glp1 and the second one, which is really the star of the show, is the white mulberry leaf extract. Okay. So, and actually, interestingly, this is completely off topic, but <laughs> mulberry leaf is what silkworms eat. Oh, really? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, totally <laughs> off topic. But so mulberry leaf contains a molecule called DNJ. Uh -huh. Okay, and so DNJ is now one of my new favorite molecules. DNJ. We love her. She's the best. <laughs> what DNJ does is she tells you little enzymes that break down carbs into glucose to just like chill and work a little bit more slowly okay and throughout this podcast i've explained what you want to do is slow down the breakdown of food and so dnj does exactly that ah. mm -hmm. and so what happens is that instead of let's say pasta or cookie by the way this also works on oat milk okay. <laughs> or right. any carbs yeah any carbs and sugars so instead of those carbs breaking down really quickly and going through to your bloodstream thanks to the mulberry leaf extract mm. They break down more slowly and more of them pass through to your microbiome instead of being all absorbed into your blood. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Super interesting. So DNG. DNJ. DNJ. Sorry, DNJ. It's like DNA. <laughs> it's like DN Jesse. DNG. Okay, DNJ. <laughs> DN Jesse. <laughs> DNJ. I, I would try. I would try and mark that. That's brilliant. DNJ. Yeah. Okay, so mulberry. I, I I mean, all I think about when I think of mulberries are the sort of ingredients that we use, usually dried mulberries and stuff like that, but mulberry leaf, that's, yeah, mulberry that's leaf. fascinating. And it's not just any mulberry leaf extract. Uh -huh. So for each of these molecules that have been proven by all these trials across the world, I sort the actual highest quality because okay. you can there's cinnamon extract and totally. cinnamon extract yeah, yeah, you know yeah. there's mulberry leaf and mulberry leaf yeah so i'm working with the absolute best scientists in the game and i'm actually really excited to talk about this because it's been two years in the making yeah now. yeah and um because yeah. you didn't mention this the last time no, we chatted because no. it was under it was, it was under wraps <laughs> you know and i'm so so proud of this product i'm just so excited and yeah i think it's fucking awesome yeah. sorry for swearing no but sorry <laughs> it really is i'm super excited and i I love the idea that some people will be able to give this to their parents or grandparents mm. who don't want to change their diets mm. but have diabetes, for mm. example. And I'm excited for people to have something in their purse they can take with them. It works on people with diabetes, without diabetes. It works on everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm so stoked. the lemon peel, that's really interesting. So that's yeah. like a natural Ozempic. Would you... Would you in a way, in okay. a way, if you want, yes. Uh, it's better than Ozempic because, yeah. so GLP-1 is this hormone in your body that tells you I'm full. You mm. know, after you've had like a big meal and you just, and your aunt is like, Rupi, yeah. have some more cake. You're like, no, <laughs> I, I'm really full. <laughs> Auntie, I really cannot. That feeling of being stuffed. Yeah. One of the reasons you feel that way is because of GLP-1, yeah. the satiety hormone. And Ozempic, what it does is it tricks your brain into thinking there's more GLP-1 mm. in your body. Mm. So it tricks your brain into thinking that you're that really, you're full. really full. Mm. What the lemon peel extract does is it actually tells your microbiome, hey, let's make more GLP-1. GLP-1 is great. It's healthy. Mm. And as a result, over six weeks, you have a 15% GLP-1 increase in your body. Oh. It's not a trick. It is actually happening. Right. And that makes me very excited yeah. because, I mean, as you know, the Ozempic craze has been crazy. Yeah. A lot of people want to feel fuller, yeah. but Ozempic is just a trick. It's not real. Whereas yeah. this is working with your microbiome to create more of that GLP-1. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm definitely going to look into that. And the, the green veg extracts that you, because I'm looking, we're looking into sort of green powders right now and, and sort of like, trying to decipher what the evidence for the markers green powders like everywhere yep. I mean, athletic greens is the the og and there's loads of questions as to whether people should be eating them whether they actually have any benefits there are certain green vegetables that we've come across mm -hmm. um, that certainly have some some evidence behind yeah. them and i think they are good supplements you know supplements are a great diet um, what are the green veggies that you decide to put in here or the polyphenols from green they're veg? amazing <laughs> okay so we have purple carrot spinach broccoli cabbage asparagus zucchini cucumber and artichoke okay yeah. great <laughs> so we have 100 milligrams of these antioxidants uh -huh. and vegetables have so many great compounds in them but the antioxidants are one, is one that is quite easy to extract when it's done well and it gives your body more capacity to fight against whatever crazy stuff you're feeding it and whatever mm -hmm. crazy stuff is happening so more antioxidants is always a good idea and i wanted to do a veggie antioxidant blend because most people need to eat more vegetables yeah, yeah. so it's a really good complementary molecule to put in anti-spike so you get some of that value mm. however still eat your veggies mm. okay i'm not saying this is replacing veggies totally. it's it's an it's an additive thing yeah because one problem i have with a lot of the green powders is that people will have that and then the rest of the day will eat no plants totally because yeah. they're like oh i had my veggie powder yeah but yeah. it's not the same yeah exactly and you know you talked about the food matrix you talked about the added benefits of that complement of different exactly. compounds that are very hard to extract in their singular form. Mm -hmm. There's lots of unknowns and probably unknown unknowns about why eating vegetables per se are just so good for you. So like the you matrix said, is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Did you see I posted recently a graph on Instagram comparing 100 grams of lentils mm. versus 100 grams of lentil pasta, mm. exact same ingredients. So it's le it's like a spaghetti yeah, made with yeah. lentil flour. They're really popular with gluten-free. Uh -huh. So exact same nutritional facts, yeah. okay? But the matrix is changed. Completely, yeah. In the lentils, no spike. In the lentil pasta, big spike. Ah. Because it's been blended and the fiber has been pulverized yeah. and it's much faster to be absorbed into your bloodstream. Ah. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, so when you when you did that uh, comparison, is it just plain lentils and plain? Completely plain. Ah. Completely plain. Exact same quantity. 
exact same molecules, yeah. just the matrix has changed. That's really interesting because lentils, unlike oats, uh, have got protein, yep. they've got fiber. And the lentil pasta as well, right? Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. the same, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. just the format that's changed. Oh, wow. So do you recommend people not have lentil pasta anymore? Or No, I mean, listen, it's so <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's, that's why people go with it. I just wanted to show this cool experiment. It's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. I lentil think it's pasta is still great for you. It's better for you than regular pasta. But also if you want to eat pasta, just eat regular pasta. Yeah. And, you know, have a veggie starter with it. You know, yeah, I'm kind yeah. of on the on the side of just eat the stuff you like and add some hacks so it reduces the impact. Totally. But I think it's cool to show that the whole version of the food is always going to be better. I, I think these are really interesting, you know, and I think I'm constantly questioning myself because we, we did a podcast on um, uh, the food matrix and juicing and smoothies. And my sort of uh, heuristic or rule of thumb is, you know, go for a smoothie rather than a juice. Juice. With the yep. juice, you're going to have like refining of the fiber and stuff. You're not going to have that sort of impact of uh, slowing the digestion of sugars because it doesn't coat your intestines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They did a small study where they compared the impact of juicing and uh, a juiced uh, fruit and and smoothied fruit, and they measured their glucose levels, and they found the exact opposite. Did they measure insulin? No, they didn't measure insulin. Nah, no, no, no. because a fruit juice really triggers high insulin release. Yes, therefore yeah, it can yeah. reduce the spike with a with a negative consequence. Because yes. you can reduce the spike of a food by increasing insulin levels. Yes, but that's not good. So you have to measure both. And they were also in healthy individuals. So mm. you'd in, you would anticipate a healthy insulin response to yep. the same food. Yep. Whereas if someone's insulin response is overwhelmed or impaired totally. because of pathology. Then yeah. So and one of the other explanations were the absorption of different polyphenols in the fruit oh, that could be yeah. uh, mimicking the yeah. sort of glucose flattening impact as well. So it's, we're always sort of questioning the things, and I think it's really important to understand the impact of the food matrix, even though we For might sure. not understand it completely at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has been fascinating. I wanted Thank to ask you, you like you know. Yeah. You, you've impacted so many people. <laughs> what is the most valuable thing that you're getting from the work that you're doing right now? Oh, interesting. I mean, um, purpose. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's hard. You know, it it's, looks all rosy on Instagram and yeah. stuff, but it's hard. I'm running a small team. You know, we're trying to make stuff. I have a big audience. I'm very careful. I understand, you know, the power that I have now with this big of an audience. So it's difficult and I try my absolute best so that everything I make is top quality. You know, in, in this book, every single sentence padding mm. on the on the boxes on a page a photograph like recipe quantity i'm in there i'm making every single thing you know anti-spike has been two years of complete and utter focus of creating a physical product the amount of regulation testing that has to go into this yeah i mean you cannot even <laughs> imagine the logistical yeah. situation this is launching globally at the same time it's just like it's huge projects so it's hard, but I love it. Yeah. And it's purpose. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a difficult day. I have to do all these things. But also I'm like, you know what? I would take this every time over my previous job, which was great, but didn't really fulfill me in the same way. Yeah. And that lends a question that, you know, you're teaching us about how to keep our glucose level steady. How do you keep yourself steady and grounded, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like mentally? Yeah. Um, I sleep a lot. I don't drink alcohol. I work out almost every day. Mm. I have a solid crew, you know, family, friends that I can count on. I cry a lot. Crying for me is a really good way to regulate my nervous system. Mm. It's a, I have very easy access to crying. So when I feel stressed or overwhelmed, I'll just cry for 10 minutes and then mm. I feel so much better. Mm. I write a lot. It helps me. I have an amazing therapist. Mm. All the boring things. Yeah, you know, I don't have like a magic solution. And yeah. then if something is really hard, I'm just like, you know, today was a really hard day. And I sort of let it move through me. I don't want to store any of the stress. I yeah. try to move it as quickly as possible. Yeah. So I have, I think I have good emotional hygiene. Yeah. I'm always like, you know, if something is hard, I'll call up a friend. I'm like, today was really hard. Can I just vent for 10 minutes? They're yeah. like, yeah, sure, babe. So I just vent and like, blah, 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 blah. And that helps, you know, processing, moving. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to lean into uh, expressive writing where I will just write and write and write and not really think about what I'm writing. And it's pretty incredible what comes out on the page, actually, because sometimes you feel you need to be a bit. Res I mean, maybe you've got like really good friends and, you know, you can just like tell them everything and everything, which is, you know, amazing. Sometimes I think particularly and this is me 
being, you know, uh, leaning to the stereotype of being a man, but it's easy to be reserved in front of people, even though you know that they've got your back. And so expressive writing for me has been like, just no filter, yeah. right? Just like put it on the page and it just comes out. Mm. And you'd be really surprised at what actually comes out when you do that. But it's good to know. And you I think people need to me. know. <laughs> I, I should. Get it. I'll just give you a voice note. I get it. <laughs> My I daily it, Jesse voice note. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, if you ever need to vent, I'm here. I love it. Oh, great, great. Well, I'm glad we're having this conversation. And thanks so much for coming to the thanks, studio. Rupi. You're the best. It's always such a joy. <laughs> seriously. If you like the episode, you will love this episode with Jesse and Chisape. We talk about glucose, the uses of glucose, and glucose hacks that can flatten your glucose curve and why that is important for health and longevity. You can check it out by clicking on the link right now.